Hello, creative people. Welcome to Creative Conversations. My name is Hollis Citron, and we are so happy that you have chosen to spend this hour with us. So I am owner and founder of I Am Creative and Express Yourself Publishing, and I am on a mission to expand the definition of creativity beyond a pencil and a paintbrush and empower people, especially adults, to own their voice that come in so many different forms. So this space was created to talk with people with all different jobs, hobbies, and interests, and have conversations about experiences and perspectives all centered around three questions. One, how do you define creativity? Two, how do you incorporate it into your life? And three, why do you think it's important? Then we have a free-flowing conversation and we see where it goes. So I have had the opportunity to talk to musicians, Reiki masters, mediums, doctor, lawyer, real estate agents, and so many more. And these conversations explore the reality that creativity is not cute, it is necessary. People have defined creativity as their soul's essence, courage, imagination, basically all that we are and want to be. So sharing these stories expands one's thinking and opens up self-expression to feel more empowered, connected, and dare I say, happy. My inspiring guest for today is Jen Taylor. Jen is a mom of 18, host of um, At a Crossroads with a Naked Pos- Podcaster, excuse me, for four and a half years. She's a transformational coach for Christian women and a motivational speaker. She is an NLP practitioner and has 15 plus years in the foster care sector as both a parent and a trainer. She's written the blog Moms Running It for 10 years, and she's a published author and so much more. Jen, welcome to the space. Hello. Hello, Jen. (laughs) You did it. Yay. (laughs) Of course. Of course. No question, right? No question. Didn't even question it for a second. (laughs) I'm very happy to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, thank you. So that little bit, those few sentences that I read are just like a snippet of who you are. And we're obviously going to dive into that. But could you give people a little bit more of a background now before we dive in? Yeah, I'm mom of 18. That means I have 18 children, like actually 18 of them, not one that is 18. There are 18 (laughs) kids in my family, which of course, as soon as people find out, that's where the conversation goes because that's so unique and odd and how and why and all of that. Uh, Aside from that, I have had a podcast for four and a half years at a crossroads with a naked podcaster. And that was launched. I wrote my book. And my book was about my story of dysfunction growing up. And I was really proud. You know, I wrote this book. This is great. And also, I realized immediately that it was one story. And initially, I thought, I want to help everybody write a book. This is Everyone should share their story. Well, not everybody wants to do that. And about nine months after my book launched um, in 2016, uh, my husband's best friend had a successful podcast, handed me my first microphone and said, start a podcast. And I just kind of like, I just did. I just started it and it's been four and a half years. And really it's kind of like writing a book in an hour. It's the way to share your story of struggle to success. I My goal is that people will feel less alone. Same with my book. You feel less alone in your struggles and also you're building tools and tricks and skill sets to be able to navigate your own struggles. So the book and the podcast are very connected. Uh, through my coaching, I took, first of all, with those 18 kids, there was a lot of training and experiences. My oldest daughter is, she'll be 30 in April of 2022. So for over 29 years, I've been parenting. I learned a lot through that and a lot because I did quite a bit of it through the foster care system. So I took advantage of every training that I could, where I could learn to be better. And then I became a trainer and I was a trainer of trainers. So it wasn't just training you as a foster parent on suicide awareness and prevention. It was training you to be a trainer. I had a really high level of training in a lot of different Um, categories. And that helped me in my journey. And also I realized that it's a really negative space, conflict resolution, um, drug and alcohol use and abuse, suicide prevention and awareness. Those are, those are really big, heavy topics that are um, kind of from a negative space and you want to know how to deal with them. But I 
took that and thought, how can I turn this into a preventative medicine type of situation? You know, how can we, how can we get through our traumas and be able to come at the world and our struggles from a different lens, not a lens of emergency room conflict resolution, but a lens of preventative me medicine. How can we get ourselves as healthy as possible? So maybe those things aren't as big stresses in our lives. And I took my journey on how I did that in my life. And then I got training in all of those ways because that's what I do. So I'm an NLP practitioner, I, I believe our traumas are holding us back, those limited beliefs and negative emotions. And that's a huge part of what's come out in my podcast too. And it even came out in my book. You see common threads in your own story um, that once you realize are there, you can kind of like scoop them up and get them together and utilize them moving forward. So my goal with with working with people is to get for them to get through their traumas, limiting beliefs and negative emotions faster, easier, and more supported than I did in a way that's, you know, not going to take them years and years and years and years, but that they can get through them pretty rapidly and become the best version of themselves, reduce their own personal stress, and then have a different lens that they view the world. Well, we're going to have a lot to talk about now, aren't we? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> we are. And um, before I even get into like all of this, uh, Naked Podcaster, where'd the name come from? It was actually a joke. My podcast started out, it was Jen Taylor rerouting. And it was, it's kind of just like you think your life or your decisions are going to be point A to point B. And it ends up being like this windy uphill battle with a Sherpa and oxygen mask and all, you know, it's just not, it's not how we anticipate things are going to go. And because of that, we feel like we're constantly rerouting. Like when you're in your car and your GPS is like, oh, just kidding. I meant you should go this way, right? And so that was what the name was. I ha also had a coach, a business coach, and I told her the same thing with buying a house. Like my realtor, I said, I want to be able to pee off my porch. Not because I will go pee off my porch, but like <laughs> th that's how close I want neighbors to be, right? You want the option, right? I want the option. I, I like uh, – I I have like no issues. I'm very extroverted and I have like very little bubble around. Like I like to hug and people can stand close to me. But when I live in a house, I don't want to hear my neighbor's toilet flush. So I like that kind of distance. And it was the same thing with a business. I was like, I don't want to have to wear pants. You know, I kind of, I want to be able to work at home and I want to be comfortable and true to myself and that sort of thing. And one day my husband came in, I was doing a podcast interview and he could walk through our bedroom where you couldn't see him, but he could see me and I didn't have pants on. And I don't remember why. I don't remember if my stomach was <laughs> bothering me or it was super hot. And so afterwards he's like, you literally did. like, I thought that was figurative, but you literally did not have pants on. I'm like, look, I could have nothing on. I could be completely <laughs> naked because you see me from the armpits up. And back in the day, you, it was audio. You know, oh, I've done video yeah. for two years of the four and a half, but the first two and a half years were audio only. Like I could be naked. And he's like, so you're the naked podcaster. And I was like, oh my gosh, I kind of love that. <laughs> yes. Although I'm not sure it fits because I have to be, if it's not super raw and genuine and authentic, I'm not going to do it just because it's a cute play on words or because people assume it's sexual when it's not, but that sells it. It's not because it's a branding thing or a clickbait title. It actually has to be true. And he's like, well, what is the premise of your podcast? I'm like, well, it says it. It says bearing it all, phys it, bearing it all emotionally exactly. and spiritually is exactly. my tagline. Yeah. And so- yeah, like I could be naked physically and in support of my guests being naked emotionally and spiritually. So it wasn't actually a cute play on words. It was exactly what my tagline said, bearing it all. Yeah. And I asked my guests, like if I can find your information online, that's real great. But if that means everybody can find it online, if you're not willing to dig deeper with me, then don't come on the show. My goal is to hold space and make you feel safe and for you to take a super deep dive deeper than what you do with most people. And like you, it's a, it's just like a conversation. You don't know what direction it's going to go in. So be prepared that you may go in a direction that something you haven't thought of for 
years and years and years. And my goal isn't to make my guests cry, but my goal is to make them tap into their emotions kind of yes. at that level. Right? Right. 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 And so I'm, I ask my guests to be raw, real, vulnerable, um, authentic, open, dig deep and bear it all spiritually and emotionally. So that is where the name came from because it was such a perfect fit to what I was doing. And it's at a crossroads with a naked podcaster because a crossroads is just a point in your life where you need to make a decision. There's a choice that's going to happen, right? You, you hit this point, you're like, do I go left or right? And, and there's pros and cons for both directions. And again, that's also the same theory as rerouting. You think you're taking the right direction. Then all of a sudden it's like, nope, you actually should have taken that last left. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. So at a crossroads just meant these are people that I'm interviewing that are at, that were at a point in their life where traumas happened, really tough situations happened, and they had to make a decision what direction they would go. And in that, they're willing to bear it all to me. They're willing to bear that story of that crossroads of that trauma with me. And I, it's like, I can't even tell you, I never knew if I would love it. And then I learned I did love it. And I think every podcast episode... I'll walk out of my office and my husband will say, how did it go? I'm like, oh my gosh, that was my favorite podcast I've ever done. That was my favorite interview. Like every one of them. Yeah. And in four and a half years and probably, I'm I'm not sure actually, I could look it up, but about 300 interviews, uh, I've only not loved two Mm -hmm. where it didn't hit home for me. And one of them I've gotten really positive feedback. And that's the interesting thing about being an interviewer. Even if half of them didn't hit home with me, it's not about just that. I am one perception. I am one person. So if your story doesn't necessarily resonate super great with me, that doesn't mean it's not going to resonate with a million other viewers. Yeah. And so sometimes it's just important, like a little side note, like get out of your own way. Because really, the whole premise behind the podcast was I have a great story, but so do millions of other people. And how can I highlight other people's stories also? Not as better than, just as another story that will resonate with a different person. And the goal has always been, well, the goal with my kids and with foster care and the goal with the podcast and the goal with my book, I think an overarching theme of mine is I just want to make a difference to that one. And when you make a difference to that one, but it happens more than one time, that creates compound interest, which is my favorite theory of all time. I think everything in life is compound interest. It's those small, easy, daily actions that add up over time. And yeah. you know that's been my goal with everything I've done in my life. That's one of those things where you look back and you're like, oh, wait, there's a common thread. I exactly. should take that and utilize that because it's something about me that – that's really specific that I just didn't recognize before today. And making a difference to that one and everything in life being compound interest are two things that I know in my entire life have been overarching. Yeah. 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 Okay. Let's just, we're going to, I am going to get specific here. You're giving tons of information, which is amazing. Um, I want to do the, would you rather, and then we're going to dive into the first question and then we're going to like explore even more all these points that you brought up. So this is going to be incredible. Um, I want to welcome the people that are here live. So thank you so much for being here. Any questions or comments, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we can see them and would love to respond. So, um, little would you rather here. So which one did I pick for you? Okay, Jen, would you rather be on a reality show or a game show? Oh, wow. Um, reality. And that that's a tough one for me. <laughs> I had a feeling you were going to pick a real, I mean, your life is a reality show. Um, yes. all, all of our lives are a reality show. Some are more extreme than others. Um, but yeah, but before we dive into the first official question, why would it be a tough one? I have been, I haven't been approached by anyone who's legitimately wanted to do a reality show, but it has been a topic of conversation many times. And I never wanted to do a reality show. One, it's fine if I put myself on the line, but I don't feel like it's fair that I would have in that situation, put my kids' lives out there for everyone to see. I think there are benefits to that, but I I feel like my children deserved autonomy. And 
I, I, that would have taken it away from them. So I, I didn't think it was fair to share other people's stories. And on a reality show with my family would have meant that I was essentially sharing other people's stories. Yeah. Yeah. And I've also learned my husband's been in TV and film for 30 years. He's an editor. There's a lot of <laughs> hate to be, well, I don't want to like burst people's bubbles if you don't know already, but there's a lot of shaping that goes on with the producers yeah. <laughs> and what they do. So not everything in a reality show is real. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of prompting that goes on and well, you could do this because it's about getting people's attention and, you know, making things bigger sometimes than they necessarily are. So anyway, okay, so good. So first official question is, how do you define creativity? Mm. Well, that's a great one because I, my freshman year of college, I took an art class. I can't hear you. All of a sudden you went, I lost you. Um, cannot hear you. I'm not sure if he did something to the volume. Um, last thing I heard was I took an art class and then all of a sudden it cut out. So maybe, um, there we go. Can you hear me now? Now I can. Yeah, and that, then it just clicked back in. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I just, I I didn't do anything, but then I did do something to get it back. So, um, yeah. so I was in an art class in my freshman year of college, and I had always been in music. So I still sing on our church's worship team. And I feel like for me, music was creativity. It was a way to express myself in a different way. So was being in, you know, plays in high school. I haven't done that since then. Since I was in high school, I haven't acted, but it's a way to be a facet of yourself that you can kind of, I don't want to use exploit in the wrong word, but you can kind of explode that part of your personality on a stage. And that has always been creative. When I took the art class at the end of the year, my art teacher said, I'll give you a C if you never take a class of mine again. Oh my God. Well, right. Except... It, yes, that was not phrased. It was phrased poorly and it wasn't a good way to encourage. However, I really, really struggled with art. And so I think creativity to me is whatever it is to you. It doesn't fit into a box. And the less we fit everything into the box and the more we just are outside of the box and doing our own thing, the better. Because what it, I did scrapbooks for every one of my kids growing up. You know, that was creative for me. It was a way to share memories. So I think for me, it's been um, how I parented my kids was very creative. The things that I did, like the scrapbooks was creative. Staying, remaining in music for my whole life has been creative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which I think is an amazing point to bring up. And that's, you know, validating my whole company. I am creative, which the whole mission is to expand the definition of what it is. So um, bringing up the parenting, bringing up the scrapbooking, bringing up the music, the theater, the if you are a business person and um, you are coming up with uh, business deals and the whole inner communi um, communication skills and taking an idea from your head and actually forming it and shaping it, all of that is creativity. What kind of bothers me about what that art teacher said is, I get it, people say things and whatever, it may not have been your space, but again, for me, it always goes back to feeling like a safe space. And maybe it doesn't look that way one, maybe what you're doing doesn't look a certain way in the room, per se, of what they were asking. But I think it's very important to meet people where they are and to allow them to then turn it into their vision and make it theirs, which is going to give them more ownership. Yeah, I agree. And definitely that art class wasn't mine, my, my uh, strong suit. However, I think I bring that up because it's so important not to discourage people within their own creativity. And it's, so it can be challenging to find the way that feels good for you to express your creativity. And especially if it doesn't fit in the box, like 
drawing the nude model in that class or drawing the piece of fruit. That was not my way right. to do it, you know? Well, yeah, that's why, I mean, I have a huge thing of creativity goes beyond a pencil and a paintbrush. Yeah. It goes yeah. beyond that whole, because people, it makes me nuts. People, it's just a huge pet peeve because I, you know, went to art school, the whole art teacher thing. But when you say your niceties of what you do, even though it's changed now in the past three years, um, people immediately get defensive and say, I can't draw or paint. I'm like, well, neither can I. Like, yeah. Even though I went to art school, that doesn't mean that's what I do. It's not my expression. I actually studied ceramics and, um, and uh, other areas. But my drawing teacher actually freshman year was horrible. She yeah. told me she drew on my paper to fix things. I worked up the guts to ask her not to draw on my paper, to show me how to fix it, not by any means that what I was doing was perfect or right. I wanted to do it in, in a way to be taught like the baseline of how to do things, um, per se, in the class. And when I asked her not to draw on my paper, she looked at me and said, well, I don't think you're good enough to do it on your own. <laughs> and I looked at her and said, I was like purple and shaking. And I looked at her and said, I didn't ask you if I was good enough. I just asked you not to draw my paper. And I got a D, um, you know, not the grades. The grades never really meant anything to me, but because um, I challenged her or whatever reason. But uh, yeah, not the best response. No, for sure. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so tell me more about, and I just have to say, the sound is a little bit weird. I'm like hearing crinkling. When you're talking, it's fine. But when I'm talking, there's like um, a crackling going on. I don't hear it. Do you have um, listeners, if you could let me know if you can hear like a crackling going on, I would appreciate it. Because um, I don't think you're wearing headphones, are you? No, and I was earlier. And hang on. Okay. Can you still hear me? Yeah, and that's better. Okay. I put yeah, them yeah. back in. I don't know why it you yeah. couldn't for a while, but yep, there we go. Yeah, yeah, okay. So tell us a little bit more about your journey, um, about where you've gotten to where you are now. Um, in, well, let me ask more specifically. Tell us more about um, the foster care, foster care system. Okay. Um, that's big and loaded, right? Yeah, um, it is. I, I grew up in dysfunction. I was not taken into foster care. My sister and I should have been taken into foster care. I remember CPS driving away when I was probably about 10, wondering why we weren't in the car. So it's interesting as a child, you know something's wrong, but you have no nothing to compare it to. And as I got older and realized, you know, understood more about the dysfunction that we went through, I'm more and more surprised. I had a third grade teacher that made an enormous difference in my life. I was worth it to her. I was beautiful. Um, I was in a play that year. It was just such a transformational year for me. And even though things in my home got worse after third grade, I knew I was worth it to my teacher. And what that taught me, what I recognized later that that taught me was that you can make an enormous difference in someone's life just by being you and without that person ever knowing it. I was lucky 21 years ago, I flew back. I was raised in Rhode Island and I flew back to Rhode Island. I was pregnant. I had five kids with me. but I had used her example and that experience so often in speaking and really the only person that should know was her, how much of a difference she made in my life. She didn't remember me. She, I didn't stand out to her for any reason, which was even better. I mean, it really showed me that just by being yourself, she was being my teacher, which was something that she loved. However, it was just by her being her. She was, she didn't single me out. There was nothing exceptional. She wasn't taking on this poor kid. She was just being herself. And what a difference she made in my entire life, the, the trajectory of it. When I got older, I knew two things. One, that I wanted to do foster care because I wanted to make a difference in the life of a child like she did for me. And also I knew that I might not be able to have children biologically. Uh, I did have children biologically. However, it just kind of made me want to do foster care more. So foster care is a very broken system of people who really 
for the most part, have their hearts in the right place. We all really want to make positive difference in kids. And we're there for the right reasons in a system that's super broken. And I can't say that I have an answer for that. I mean, you could put a panelist of foster care experts together, a hundred of us, and I'm not sure that we would entirely agree on how to make it less broken, which is a good thing and a bad thing. I mean, we learn more as time goes on. They try different things. Um, I don't think termination happens fast enough because in my perception of foster care, when that child is in a situation that is not beneficial, it's abusive or neglective, and the parent is given the option to kind of get things together. They're given classes and skills and support financially, emotionally, through therapy. They're given everything, every tool that they need to be successful as parents. If they either don't take advantage of that or don't do what they've learned in a certain period of time, I think those kids should be adopted out. And that maybe isn't a popular I mean, I think reunification is number one. And if it can't happen, those kids need to have permanency somewhere else. Five of my 18 kids are kids that, um, well, a couple of them have aged out of the foster care system with me. And I've seen the direct repercussions of never having permanency, never feeling like, yeah, they call me mom and I'm their family, but they, they kind of never sort of lose hope that their parents will get it together. And they never feel the permanency of my home. They're kept in this limbo state. And so, again, if I went in and made changes, a, a million other people would hate them. So you have to understand that it is people wanting the best in a very broken situation. And mm -hmm. so you have to kind of navigate it with that in mind. And knowing that as a foster parent wanting to really do the best for these kids, you will be heartbroken beyond what you imagine and it will have been worth it. And that doesn't make sense until you experience it, I think. Yeah. So many of the things that you just said, and I heard everything that you said, also kind of correlate with the coaching that yeah. one does and with what you do. Things that you said, like um, I kind of correlated to anybody that you could be given every tool that's needed, but if you don't do anything with it, then what's the point? <laughs> like, right. Like right. You, you stay in this state of limbo and uh, you could be like, well, why isn't anything changing? And why isn't it anything, you know, why isn't there any progression? And that's, that's a whole, that's a whole thing. Um, even when what's right in front of us or what we're exposed to, if we don't actually take the time to connect it in and bring it into our world, then um, nothing changes. Um, at least not for the way that we want it to be. And the fact that you're never, oh, you're never going to make everybody happy. No, no, and, for sure. And we can't, it's just not possible. Yeah, that's true. And I, you know, also with agencies as massive as foster care, yeah, you're definitely not going to make everyone happy. And uh, again, I could make, they could ask me and I could make all of these changes, but I, a, another group of people is going to be unhappy and there's going to be other parts of it. It's still going to be a broken system where people are doing it. Hopefully. I mean, the people that work within foster care, not the foster parents, but actually the social workers, yeah. I, I haven't really in 15 years of working in foster care, the 15 years that I did, I haven't really experienced a social worker that was awful. Mm -hmm. I've disagreed with them. I just feel like you have to make really, hard calls and there isn't necessarily a cut and dry right answer and they're doing the best they can within the scope of what the, they're doing the best they can in the situation they're in basically. And for foster parents, I mean, I'm going to say for the foster parents that are doing foster care for the right reasons, which is not for money mm -hmm. and who are not also perpetuating an abuse cycle, which some of them do. Um, and it's easy to hear all of the statistics that are negative because that's just, isn't that easy when somebody comes forward and says, yeah, I was put in foster care, but they were as abusive. I am really sorry about that because that shouldn't happen. I think the greater majority though are not like that. And that's what I saw in 15 years is that the foster parents for the most part are doing it really for the right reasons. And look, it's hard. 
It's the hardest work you'll ever do. Parenting is the hardest thing you'll ever do. Doing it in a situation like foster care is yeah. exponentially more difficult. You have this list of challenges that don't exist in other situations. And it is really hard. And that's for the parent, the child, the social worker, the biological parents, for everyone involved. It is a super hard situation. So I think coming at it with realizing that there, you need a lot of grace for everyone involved. And that's hard. It's hard, especially if you're the foster parent and you're talking about giving grace to the biological parent who you've, you've read this list, this laundry list of assaults that have happened, of things that they've either done or allowed to be done to these kids. You know, it's real hard to come at that with grace. And and you have to. And I, I eventually stopped doing foster care. And it was because of the situations within the foster care system that were broken. Yeah. And I had two situations with two kids that I count as my 18, but they weren't handled in the best way for that child. And that doesn't mean I got my way. I'm saying in the best interest of that child, whether that meant they stayed with me or not is moot. It wasn't in the child's best interest. And I think foster care should be looking a lot more at what's in the child's best interest and a lot less at what's in the biological parent's best interest. Yeah, that totally makes sense. As you were saying stuff in the very beginning of all of this, it's like, yeah, and how does it serve the child? There's, we, we create rules, we create things that, oh, well, this will work and that'll work just in life. Well, if it's in order to have structure, but then when we come back to your definition, which is the whole, you know, being out of the box exploring your personality. It's, it's figuring out what works for that person, what will benefit them the most to grow as a human. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, again, lots of lessons learned. I parented all of my kids the same as far as these are things that you get consequences for. This is the end result that I'm looking for. Um, I parented each of them completely differently based on their personalities though. Mm -hmm. So my approach was not the same. There is no one way to parent. And I had 18 individual ways to parent and not, yes, some of the same things work all the time with all of them. But certainly, you know, I, I have a son with autism. He's not going to get treated the same way as the other kids just because of that. Right. And then within that, there are personality differences and so you have to kind of cater your parenting to the individual child, even though the choice and accountability and consequences kind of system you have is the same and the end goal is the same. I wouldn't talk to them all the same. It right. wouldn't make sense. And I think in a bigger scope like foster care, you that would be too overwhelming. I mean, that's overwhelming with 18 kids. But in the foster care system, it does have to be a little bit more black and white because you're serving the masses. And that definitely means that people in that situation, there are going to be people that get hurt and stepped on. Right. Right. Huh. Okay. So let's move on to the second part because I want to also explore this part Um I'll just give like a little hint of this RV world with you, plus many other things. But ah, um, yeah, <laughs> I think that's so cool. So, uh, how do you incorporate more creativity into your own life? Well, that's looked different at different times. I mean, for creativity, there was a period of time when, like, I I hate having garage sales, but I love going to them, and I love taking something that's old, like not necessarily an antique, but taking that really old piece of furniture that just looks destroyed and I would bring it home and refinish it. And that was cathartic and hugely creative. And I brought that into my life for a long time. And that kind of morphed into uh, doing some of those DIY projects at home. You know, as a kid that grew up, it, it wasn't just growing up in dysfunction. We grew up uh, at, at or below poverty level. And so I learned you had to fix stuff. Like I fixed my toilet this morning and <laughs> I know how you. to fix, I know, I know how to fix a toilet because we had to kind of learn how to fix stuff because hiring somebody to do it wasn't necessarily an option and you needed your toilet. And that went to like back in the day, hooking up the VCR to the Atari to the, I'm aging myself here. To the, <laughs> I totally, to the, I understand <laughs> the language. Yes. Yeah. You just, whatever happened, just happened again. I can't hear you. Okay. 
There we go. <laughs> Hello? Okay. It's so odd. I'm actually sitting in the same spot, but for some reason, my headphones just completely shut off. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'll try to plug them back in again in a minute. I know it's better that okay. way. Um, okay, one of the things is that, you know, it morphs. So I learned how to fix things growing up. So that meant DIY projects in my home. And that meant refinishing furniture because it was cathartic. And I was passionate about taking something broken. I mean, similarly to a, a theme in my life, taking something that seems broken or needs a lot of love and giving it to them and seeing that thing have a totally new life, like come to life or um, be beautiful again or and then that kind of, we, we are minimalists and that journey started about in, in earnest about seven years ago. And that was because, you know, we had 12 kids at home and we lived in 2,300 square feet, but that's 12 kids in 2,300 square feet. And our house was overwhelming and it was stressing us out. And so we looked at, okay, we don't need another container to organize stuff. We need to actually eliminate things. And then the, then the RV and doing an RV renovation. Uh, we hired for part of this RV renovation and then I did a lot of it and holy cow, I learned how much I loved it. And that is creative. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> so creative. So fun. Holy cow. It's fun. <laughs> so I think that's when you say like we use the word, you know, obviously this is creative conversations, but in saying that word a lot, I think we could replace that where you're just like, it's fun. And I think people yeah. need to understand that it's not like I, the word creative. Obviously, it's what I do and it's what I am a creative inspirer. But we use the word a lot. Um, so it's replacing that word with how it feels and how it affects our life. And it feels fun. And when it feels fun, it creates more connection. Um, you're actually giving yourself permission to do these things um, to bring into your life which will enhance your life, uh, which brings out joy. It's just, I mean, at the center of everything, don't we just want joy and happiness and love? I think so. I think, I think that that's loaded, but yes, I think we do want to, I think what we want more than anything is to be seen, honestly. So in that being seen for who you truly are uh, means that you feel joy and love. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah. I guess I I would, it would be a slightly different direction. I hear you on that of wanting to be seen. Um, I think that can actually, my next multi-author book is called Invisible No More, Stepping Into the Spotlight. Um, but I've realized that there's different takes, there's different angles that can be taken on that because people don't want to be seen all the time. There's times where we need to go inward and kind of become a little invisible, um, to rebuild and, um, to kind of just take a break and go inward, um, to then be able to go outward to connect. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I think that really depends on personality and introversion. Um, but even as like an ultimate extrovert, I still like to have time by myself to kind of decompress. So Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, a lot goes into that. But yes, people are looking to have, I mean, my, my whole coaching program, a huge part of it is adding gratitude and joy to your life, L looking through the world at a different lens, like getting through the traumas, but then changing the lens in which you view the world. Because mm -hmm. once the lens in which you view the world is altered, you're looking at it with more positivity and joy and gratitude. So that's huge. I think people are looking for that. I think often we're looking in the wrong place. So the creativity aspect I love because it means that you can do it in the way that brings you joy and I can do it in the way that brings me joy. And they're mm -hmm. not at all the same. Yeah, they can, they can be, there's ways that it could be similar, but it's different because we, like you said, we have different lenses and perspectives. So we, it's just going to look different regardless um, if there are similarities or if it's something completely different. Some people like in being an adventurist, they might, you know, want to go uh, bungee jumping. And um, that to them is like this creative outlet where it just gives them like freedom 
And when you feel this, when you feel all these things, then it opens you up to all these different areas of your imagination and, and problem solving and all these kind of things and how you approach life. Um, whereas somebody might be like, I'm not that much of an adventurous, but you know, I I'll do some, journaling, meditation, or, you know, exercise, or, you know, maybe I run marathons as opposed to jumping off bridges. Um, Correct. Yeah. Kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, that'd be me. I'm, I'm that level adventurous. <laughs> the marathon? Yeah, I, I like to run half marathons. I'm only half crazy. Um, <laughs> that's yeah, impressive. I, I don't like the jumping off bridges thing. But that's the thing is that we all look at it. We're all looking at it for what fulfills us, mm -hmm. what fills you up. And that's the thing that's really exciting. Yeah, exactly. Because when we're feeling that, when we find that thing that fills up, there's so many people I talk to and they're like, oh, I don't know what I like to do anymore. Because we get so stuck in that, you know, you hear it a lot, but you get stuck in the hamster wheel. It's just real. You get stuck in responsibility and paying the mortgage and the family or the commitment, the job and whatever. And people are always like, I'm too tired. I'm too tired. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know what? You won't be so tired if you actually take, everybody has 10 minutes. Everybody has yeah. 10 minutes to do something that nourishes them, whether it's that drink that will nourish you and make you feel more invigorated or taking that walk or singing um, in your living room or on a stage or whatever that is, or using your imagination and just brainstorming or taking paint and throwing it on something like everybody has 10 minutes and that 10 minutes when you're in the flow of it and you realize how good it feels will turn into 20 minutes, will turn yeah. into an hour, because you're going to give yourself permission, because you're like, this feels really good. And because this feels really good, I'm actually like a different person. Absolutely. <laughs> so let's take it back to you realizing, I love the analogy to you finding, you know, um, things at garage sales and refurbishing them and this whole D, you know, it has a deeper meaning, the DIY, but, and then kind of that whole looking at, you know, wanting to make things more beautiful with the RVs. Like you didn't know that you like, that's like, talk about that's interior design. That's like making all of these decisions, colors, textures, the feeling, like all of this kind of stuff, like how did it exactly, I know you kind of mentioned it, but how did it, how did it start to dive in a little deeper? We wanted to move into an RV full time and we're, there are two types of people who live in RVs full time. One people that travel and the other are people that are stationary and we're stationary where we could drive away anytime we wanted to but we stay parked in the same place because we live and work in this area. So it's just replacing the home that we live in. And it was kind of the, the end result of the minimalism journey. And now almost all of the kids are adults. We have one left at home and she homeschools. And so we have a lot of freedom in that, that we can live in whatever we want and do whatever we want. My husband is amazing because although he loves the lifestyle and wants it, I don't think on his own, he would be doing it. He knows how important it is to me and he's totally game for it, but I am the initiator and um, he's humoring me. <laughs> and one, <laughs> one of the reasons that, you know, people are like, why do you want to live in an RV? That like, I don't entirely know how to answer that, except that I moved a lot as a kid. I've moved a lot my whole life. My husband and I have been in the same town but we've moved four times in seven years and we rent and it hasn't been fun. It's, you know, it's not fun to pack up and find another place and move. And until we decide we want to buy a house, which we don't, that's a choice. Then how can we keep more permanency or how can, if I'm asked to move, I take the home with me. And that was a really big thing for me. That's part of um, the only way I know how to say it is the baggage of me growing up, but it's not baggage in a bad way. People always mm -hmm. assume that baggage is this bad thing. I felt like I, there's safety for me in knowing that all of my favorite things are in one place. And if I need to move, I just need to turn it on and drive it mm. instead of boxing it all up, finding a place and doing that. There's some amount of permanency. 
So it was partially because it was our, our part of our minimalism journey and having fewer kids and downsizing. It also opened up the possibility to travel more easily taking what we own with us. So I can go across the country if I want to and feel like I'm, I always feel like I'm home. And I think that that was a big thing for me, no matter what I do um, for work or with kids or where I live or where I'm going, that you can't take my home away from me. Mm. And so emotionally, it meant a lot to me to move into an RV. And, and also in our minimalism journey, we just kind of decided, we looked at tiny houses, we looked at all kinds of different RVs and what would this look like and what do we want and what's our, ultimately our end goal. And ultimately, another thing is that, you know, in the midst of all of this happening, this was unexpected. Financially, we save a lot of money by doing it, but also it, it opened up a whole other world of potentially offering um, affordable housing. So we would prefer to buy a home where we can have an RV parked and then have a shed and then have, have a, actually a couple of things parked on our property that we could rent out. So we're offering affordable housing to other people who also want to downsize. So there are so many elements to like the RV. How did this process happen and why? There, there, it's not like a cut and dry mm -hmm. uh, situation. Like I want to travel the United States and... I couldn't keep a house. It's, it's so many, there's so many layers to why do we want to move into an RV? And in this particular RV, so we bought one, um, we had to have help renovating it because there ended up being so much water damage. And I was a huge part of that process. And then I had started the process and I am finishing the process of the renovation. And so in the part of it that I do, I learned like, it's not just design, it's power tools too. It's measuring, it's that nothing's square, it's it's a lot of stuff. And I realized how much I actually love doing that part of it, which was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Taking something ugly and brown and making it feel like a home. I mean, if you look at RVs, they don't look homey. Well, how can you make it look and feel homey? When you walk in, you go, wow, this is not at all what I was expecting. And that's right. the reaction you want you want it to feel like a home that's just a smaller size so the i mean there are so many parts of this rv journey but basically it was a culmination of our minimalism process and it's been a fun part it was also in this day and age less expensive to do that first than to buy a home get the home dialed into where we want and add rvs to it um and so not only was it less expensive to purchase and renovate than a home, it was, it's also, we can live in it while we find a home. And, and so we're saving money to do that. We're saving more money. So it's been an interesting journey going in a lot. Talk about like rerouting, like it's gone in lots of different directions. And you know, it's not a bad thing to say that I've done it. Mm -hmm. We end up buying a home and using it for um, someone else to have more affordable housing option I, I, because I've done it. I know everything in and out about it. So, right. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun. It's been very unexpected. So, isn't that great though? I mean, that's just so beautiful. And it goes back to the whole out of the box thing is, and I, we, you'd mentioned in the very beginning, we don't always know, we don't know how things are going to go. You could plan and plan and plan, but things there are lots of surprises that just kind of present because we don't have control over everything and i actually love that part i think if you lean into that a little that things yes. um, do not happen in an expected way that th it's actually kind of an adventure and yes. that's been fun and i don't, I don't know what it's going to continue to look like i know that it's fun now and we've just kind of gone with it um and we're going to continue to do that and, yeah. and that'll be fun. But it is definitely a culmination of minimalism. I mean, other than living out of a backpack and touring Europe, there's not a lot, which is not something that I want to do. There's a lot, not a lot further I could take my minimalism journey than downsizing and living in an RV. And um, what's been the most poignant that I would say I did expect, and it has not disappointed, is that it's interesting to see how little you can live on or to really hone down what's the most important to you. It shifts your value system for yeah. sure. Um, and I had 18 kids worth of knickknacks that they made me in craft classes that, you know, I mean, I really had to go through some sentimental stuff 
and what means the most to you. And um, seeing where you put your time, effort, and energy into things that maybe aren't the most beneficial places to put that. And when you're downsizing your space and your belongings, it, it exposes a lot of who you are. And that gives you the chance to be curious about that and make changes. Yeah. So, so important. It's yes. Like even if you, even if you listeners, even if you're not, you know, downsizing your space physically, it's that whole decluttering and getting rid of what really isn't serving. And uh, it's true. We, it, it's this whole societal thing and, you know, all this, whatever you, you, you get, you get, you get, you have, you have, you have these objects, you have these things, but what really matters. Um, I remember this show um, uh, at the, I can't, my brain is at the Statue of Liberty, um, the island, which I can't remember the name of right now, basically right in New York is you go and you see they had this amazing show where it's all of these objects that people brought with them when they were on the boats and they came through Ellis Island. Wow. And uh, you got to see and they even attached, which was amazing. Um, you pressed a button and you got to hear a narrator speak about the objects and what they brought. And I, it just has always stuck with me. Um, you know, people bringing candlesticks. Why would they bring a candlestick? Because, you know, maybe they, uh, for um, Shabbat, um, every Friday night, they light the candles or it came from their, you know, grandparents and it has real meaning to them. Um, people, you know, bring certain shoes and just all, it's like that whole concept and I'll put it out there to everybody. What would you bring? If you could yeah. only take a few items with you, what would you bring with you? It's pretty powerful. It's very powerful. You you learn what's the most important to you through this process. And I think that that's, I'm not surprised by that. That wasn't a surprise. I did. I don't think I realized how impactful that would be. And it changes your decisions moving forward also, because you don't want to allow that stress and chaos of things that you don't really want or need that don't bring you joy. I mean, Marie Kondo says, hold every item you have and ask yourself, you know, does it bring you joy? Would you buy it again right now? And is it useful? So you're either using it or it's bringing you joy because well, I'm not using the picture on my wall, but the picture on my wall brings me joy. And to really hone down things that are either useful or bring you joy is it's really, it's, shows a lot about who you are. Yeah. Whew. We're already getting to the top of the hour. So as we're, as we're getting there, I um, want to kind of wrap it up with the third question, um, which is, so why is creativity important? I think it's what makes you feel like a really unique individual it's a way to express your joy to yourself and to others. Um, it is also a huge way that you can feel sane in a world where there's a lot of turmoil. It's um, part of what can ground you and make you feel connected to something outside of yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think those are some reasons that it's really important. It's an outlet for who you are. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, get to know yourself, people. <laughs> yeah, really, truly, get to know yourself. Yeah. It is not, yeah, it, it can be a process because so many people have become so disconnected uh, because there's just so much noise. Absolutely. It's. I, I like how you said in the beginning about being an extrovert but still wanting to have a space where you could, you know, pee off the porch. Um because we do need that. There's so much going on. Even if you are at home, there's so much like social media and so many visuals and like so much that's kind of coming at you um, that really getting to know who you are and doing things, taking action and trying things. And I, it's something that I could never stress enough to my students um, in the classroom and still working with clients and talking to people like make mistakes. <laughs> You are going to make mistakes. It's inevitable that things aren't going to work out in ways that you envision and embrace it because so often, 
so often they lead to things that you never would have thought of, which is the beauty. It's it's like you're saying, it's the journey. It's that unexpected is a beautiful gift. Yeah, no kidding. It really is. And getting to know yourself more is something super valuable. You can capitalize on the things that you do well that are in your zone of genius. And that also means that you get to find people who are resources to help you in areas that are not your zone of genius. And wouldn't that be great if we all could do that for each other? Yeah. Actually recognize that in each other and not feel like we have to know everything. Yes. Yeah. I mean, really? Because I'm not good at everything. So I want to find someone who is. They can highlight who they are and what they're good at, and I can have a resource. Right. Yeah. That, that sh- that would be a great thing if we all did that. I just kind of like giggle because I thought of the parenting. I only have two kids, but um, like certain things, it's, it's it, you know, I always make a joke. It's like, you don't come with a handbook. Like, I, I just, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. So even like things, they'll be like, well, mom, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? I'm like, I'm not sure. <laughs> and they're like, well, what am I supposed to do? I'm like, babe, I- I'm not saying that I'm not going to help you with it. I, I just... I don't know. So I can either help guide you through a process of figuring it out. Um, I can give you some tools and walk away and let you do it. Um, Or it's just, it's just funny because I look at you like you have all the answers. No, it's great to know that you don't have all the answers, but you can find out. I don't know, but we can find that out. I mean, really, we have, we're the information world right now and we can find anything else. So I don't have to like, let yourself off the hook. I don't need to have all the answers. I just need to know how to ask. <laughs> I, I spoke to someone recently. She cracked me up. She said to their firstborn, they said, look, we don't know what we're doing. And she said her 14 year old looked at her and was like, really? She's like, we've never done this before. <laughs> Yeah. I just, she said it was just so funny because they were truly shocked because, and when I mentioned it to my daughter, she's like, well, yeah, because we're just used to you being the parent. So right. that's the only way we think she's like, and then the person I was talking to said, you know, it's like making the pancakes. You usually burn the first pancake. <laughs> right. The first one's not good. It's just not good. I know. I apologize <laughs> to my oldest daughter. I'm like, I'm like, thanks for being the guinea pig. I really <laughs> appreciate you taking one for the team. Exactly. Um, I'm sorry, and you're welcome. So, you know. <laughs> there it is. I'm sorry, and you're welcome. I'm sorry. Oh my! You're the, you're the first pancake. I'm sorry. <laughs> Jen, can you please tell people how they can connect with you? The easiest place is to actually go to the blog. I I just recently lost ten years of subscribers and um, three years of content, which was actually not as bad as painful as it could be, but the blog is momsrunningit.com. And you can use the contact form there, all my social media is there. So basically once you get there, you can, it's easy to find me on whatever platform is best for you, but momsrunningit.com and please subscribe. Legitimately lost 10 years of subscribers, so. Oh my God, that sucks. It's painful, that's really painful. So. Yeah, that's the easiest way to find me. And I love when people connect and reach out. So definitely don't don't hold back in your connecting and reaching out. I love it. And we didn't even get to talk about that. So actually, before we say our goodbyes, is there anything that you want to say in regards to the blog or just any last words that you feel like need to need to be said? I think if you're thinking about doing something or you want to know more about yourself, just do it. Become curious. It's not, there is no failure. There's only feedback. So it's, if you just think of things as it's not failure, it's feedback. It's really easy and kind of fun adventure to figure out what things you want to do and what that looks like for you. And, and remember that it's not going to be a straight line from point A to point B ever, ever is it going to be a straight line. I love it. That is a perfect way to end. Jen, thank you so much for taking this hour to chat. Really appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate you. Yeah, yeah. Well, good. Wonderful. And we appreciate you listeners. Thank you to those here being live and thank you to those catching the replay. Really appreciate your time and taking this hour. I know time is very precious. So um, appreciate you tuning in and listening. Um, This space is all about inspiring each other 
connecting and sharing stories. So please like, follow, and share so we can spread the goodness. Um, it's just, I feel like we've always needed this, but I feel like we need it now more than ever. So um, I look forward to connecting again really soon. And I wish you a good morning, a good afternoon, a good evening, wherever you are in this world. And we'll be talking again really soon. So goodbye, everybody. Feeling inspired? There are so many ways to do things for you, to get yourself moving, to get your creative juices flowing, and to have fun. Check out I Am Creative and Express Yourself Publishing. Go to IamCreativePhilly.com, IamCreativePhilly, P-H-I-L-L-Y.com, and check out the experiential kits. Check out Creative Shui which is all about creative inspiration and guidance. And for Express Yourself Publishing, there's so many multi-author book opportunities. So I would love to chat with you so much. Everybody has, everybody's creative. Everybody has a voice. Everybody has an expression. And I can't wait to meet you. Thank you so much for taking this hour to listen to our stories and share the energy. And I wish you a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in this world. Bye, everybody.